Good morning and welcome to Trevor Phillips on Sunday. Later this morning, the nation will remember those who died in armed conflicts over the past century. In a moment, we'll hear from Britain's top soldier, a veteran of Afghanistan, Iraq and Northern Ireland, on war and the men and women who keep us safe. Yesterday, COP26 drew to a close with an agreement in Glasgow, but many developing countries say that nations which have grown rich over the past 200 years on the use of fossil fuels now want to rob them of the chance to lift their poorest out of destitution. Some island states say that the timetable agreed amounts to a death sentence for their nations. The issues could not be more serious, and we have an appropriately weighty panel today. After grueling two weeks of negotiations, I'll be speaking to the president of COP26, Alok Sharma, to get his take on the talks. It is, of course, Remembrance Day, and this week I spoke to the chief of the defence staff, General Sir Nick Carter, as he prepares to retire from the army after more than four decades. For Labour, we'll speak to the party's leading climate change voice, Shadow Business and Energy Secretary Ed Miliband, and we'll get an independent analysis of what has and hasn't been achieved at COP from Oxford's Professor of Energy Policy and Economics, Sadita Helm. The Commonwealth Secretary General, Baroness Scotland, will tell us what's at stake for vulnerable Commonwealth nations set to bear the brunt of climate change. And much of the talk over the last two weeks has been about coal. So we'll get a view from one of the world's biggest producing countries with former Australian Foreign Minister Alexander Downer. The nation will fall silent at 11 o'clock today, remembering all those who made the ultimate sacrifice in service of this country. Her Majesty the Queen will be at the Cenotaph to lead the National Remembrance Day service. It'll be particularly poignant for General Sir Nick Carter, the Chief of the Defence Staff, who will soon retire from that role and from the British Army, which he joined back in 1977. There's been no shortage of major issues for him to contend with in the last few years, and when I spoke to him at the Royal Hospital Chelsea, I started by asking about the most pressing, Afghanistan, and how he felt about the chaotic withdrawal of Western troops. It was tough. Um, it wasn't the outcome that any of us wanted. Um, and we hoped right up until the end that the Afghan government and its armed forces would be able to hang in there and create the sort of circumstances in which you could get a proper political reconciliation. So for all of us, it was tough. And of course, for those who fought in Afghanistan against the Taliban, who now are in power, that was particularly difficult because, of course, they were the enemy at the time. It must take a lot for soldiers now, having fought in the way that they did, you did, in Afghanistan, to um, have to talk to the Taliban. Is that what we have to do now? Um, we certainly have to engage them for a number of reasons. I mean, first and foremost, there are still Afghans who worked with us, who we are worried will be the subject of vendettas, and we would like to see them find a way out of Afghanistan, and we would like to look after them to achieve that. Uh, secondly, we're very worried about the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan, and that's been in the media this week. Uh, and in order to resolve that, one has to engage with the Taliban government to, to try and make sure the money gets to where it needs to get to. And then I think also, um, we need to engage with them to get them to understand that they need to govern inclusively. Because um, many of the gains that we made in the 20 years that we were engaged there, we could lose if they don't govern inclusively. And the rights of women, the opportunity for girls to go to school, uh, and the rights of all minorities in Afghanistan need to be properly respected. And if that doesn't happen, then the answer is that we will have failed. It must be a bitter pill to swallow, though, for not you, but someone like you, to have to sit down opposite both people that you fought against and also people that, frankly, in what they want to do, what they did before when they were government, feels abhorrent. Yes, but I, but I think um, we've all been around long enough to know that wars generally end in a conversation and they generally end with a compromise. Now, if Afghanistan turns out in five years' time to be a country that has been governed inclusively, in which the rights of all of its people are properly respected, then I think we can look back on our intervention in Afghanistan with some satisfaction. There's a big if at the front end of that. And if that means that we have to talk to people that we originally regarded as the enemy, 
then so be it. Uh, it's tough to do, but let's face it, that's how we achieve peace in Northern Ireland. Uh, before they came into government this time, the Taliban said, we're different. Do you really believe that? Um, I think they have definitely done some, some things already that are different. I mean, the fact that the media is still being allowed to operate and to report relatively honestly in Afghanistan is a good indicator. Um, <clears throat> it is still the case that women are not in the government and are not going to secondary education, but they are going to primary education, and that is different to what they did in the past. Um, so there are things that are going on in Afghanistan which are definitely different to what they were uh, 20 years ago. And that, I think, is because this Taliban government, should we call it Taliban 2 rather than Taliban 1, they recognise that 60% of Afghans have been born since 2001. And that's a very large proportion of the population who've seen a slightly different country to the one that predated 2001. And the Taliban, at the end of the day, know that they have got to take people with them if they're going to govern effectively. They can't govern completely brutally. That just won't work in the modern environment. Because the thing that's really changed is social media and modern media. And they can't put that back in the box. Are you in favour of the kind of inquiry, perhaps a public inquiry, into Afghanis the Afghanistan um, exercise? Well, I think we need to be clear that I think, unlike Iraq, nobody, I think, was in any doubt that the reason for entering Afghanistan in the first place was just. There was a unanimous Security Council resolution. Indeed, Article 5 of the NATO Treaty uh, was placed on the table. So I don't think anybody's in any doubt that it was a just war. I think there are some big questions that need to be answered about how the war was conducted thereafter. Um, and those are lessons that both policymakers and military figures, and for that matter, more broadly, the development community need to learn. Whether the right way of achieving that is through a public inquiry or not, I don't know. Because I don't think this is about apportioning blame or anything like that. This is about making sure that we all learn from the experience so that next time we have to do something like this, we do it better than we did this time. You said that you could imagine Afghanistan being a tourist destination. Really? Well, what I was trying to say is that um, in the great swathe of history, you know, nobody would have thought uh, in the late 1970s that Vietnam would ever be a place that Westerners would go on holiday. You know, 50 years downstream, Vietnam is an extraordinarily successful country. The point I'm trying to make is give everything time. Are we in danger of entering a new Cold War with China? No, I don't think we are. <clears throat> and indeed, I don't think that's the right direction of travel. Now, I think we... Everybody recognises that um, this century is going to be the Asian century and that China is going to be at the heart of that um, and that there are going to be many areas where we need to work with China and indeed uh, engage with China and trade with China because that's where the economic value is going to come from. I think we will also um, observe that there are things that China does which we don't approve of. Uh, China's human rights record, the way it's behaving with the Uyghurs and with Hong Kong, are things that we will absolutely call them out on. What could we possibly do to defend Taiwan? Um, well, I, there's some big questions there about whether it's um, our task to defend Taiwan. Um, <clears throat> and that's not something that I'm going to opine on because these are political judgments. I mean, I think what uh, I would say as a military officer um, is that ultimately we want to make sure that um, we don't go to war over issues like that uh, because that would not be in anybody's interests. And your advice is it would be plausible for the military in whatever configuration to defend Taiwan against uh, Chinese aggression? The answer is that I have not considered it yet. Um, and I think, you know, my military advice is always going to be uh, to try and avoid going to war. The um, former MI6 officer, Christopher Steele, told uh, Sky News that Russian leaders believe that they're at war with the UK and its allies. That makes sense to you? Do you agree with that? Well, <clears throat> I think that um, Russia um, probably regards the... Uh, global strategic context as a continuous struggle uh, in which I think they would apply all of the instruments of national power uh, to achieve their objectives uh, but in so doing don't want to bring on a hot war. Um, so yes I think in a way he's right. The question of course is how you define war and I would tend to, as a soldier would tend to define war as the actual act of combat and fighting uh, and I think they don't want to do that. I think they want to try and achieve their objectives in rather more nuanced ways. Let's talk about the armed services that uh, you are leaving behind as you retire. Are they fit for purpose? Um, point, I guess, is, is what you think their purpose is. Uh, and if uh, you believe that we're here to deter war from happening, then my judgment is that um, our armed forces 
are very much uh, fit for deterring our enemies. Of course, one has to remember that we do this in an alliance. We do it in NATO. NATO is the bedrock of our security. And fundamentally, we see our security being delivered through uh, that European relationship at the heart of NATO. And the answer is that um, we are very much uh, leaders within NATO. And I'm pretty confident that we're well prepared to do what we have to do as part of that NATO alliance. The Secretary of State complains that um, women are still unlikely to get to the most senior roles in the armed services. Uh, do you agree? And if so, uh, I suppose he would be saying this is a failure on the part of you and your colleagues. Um, yes, I mean, the, the facts are clear. We do not have enough women at the top of the armed forces. We have more than we did have, but we don't have enough. And there's a reason for that. <clears throat> and that's because the armed forces are a bottom-fed organisation. And um, if you think back a few years, it was only in 2016 when I, as the Chief of the General Staff took the decision to open all roles up to women in the army, including the combat roles. And up until that point, you know, 60% of the roles in the army were available to women, but not all of them. So it was difficult, of course, for women to rise up through the ranks in order to be able to get to the highest possible ranks. I think we've done a lot to try and adjust the career structure as well, because the career structure is one that, frankly, was designed for men. Um, and we've had to change that, and we are changing it, uh, to make it easier for women, if they wish to raise families, to take time out to do that, and then to be promoted based upon their potential, rather than what they do during their 30s, as that's the sort of typical age that we're talking about. But fundamentally, it's also about culture. And what we have to do is to create a culture in the armed forces which looks to maximise everybody's talent and not to be exclusive in the way it does it. The nature of warfare is changing. I mean, is laddishness necessarily part of modern warfare? One might equally argue geekishness is part of modern warfare. When I talk about there's a difference between the nature of war, <clears throat> which is a political act, it's about combat, it's about fighting, and it's about uh, human interaction in a violent way, the character of warfare is different. And that's where you bring in geekiness, cyber, and all these other things. I still believe that it will be necessary for uh, soldiers in the final analysis to have to go close and personal with each other in order to achieve an outcome if you are fighting a genuine war. And that is the nature of war. So the answer is that it will still be necessary to have people who are prepared to do that. A tenfold increase in reports of rape by teenagers in the armed forces, which you've yourself said are truly shocking. If, if we keep that idea that we have to have these warriors, this type of warriors, is it a consequence of that that we're going to have to live with that kind of, I don't want to even call it behaviour? Uh, no, we're absolutely not going to live with that sort of behaviour because what we're going to do is to make sure that our values and standards, which are well understood, are properly enforced. And we're absolutely going to make sure that uh, the leaders in the armed forces understand those values and standards and recognise that it is their task, on the one hand, to make sure that we are capable of fighting if we have to fight, but on the other hand, that we're capable of building inclusive teams in which everybody feels respected, a key value, and in which everybody feels that through being included, they are able to contribute to our ultimate purpose. And that is why the stories that we're hearing at the moment in, in the media and which have, uh, are being properly investigated are shocking because they are generally, I suspect, a failure of leadership. And they need to acknowledge that it is perfectly respectable on the one hand to be able to fight, but on the other hand, you need to do it in a sensible and civilised way. And that matters on the battlefield as well. Because if we lose sight of our values and standards on the battlefield, and if we lose sight of the importance of the rules of war, then we will lose the moral high ground in relation to our opponents. And that's pretty fundamental as well. We've seen in recent days uh, allegations, and in fact they're pretty well founded, of the behaviour of troops in Kenya. Uh, it's, a, it's a scandal really, isn't it? Um, the allegations are truly shocking um, and um, it's absolutely vital that we get to the bottom of them as quickly as possible and that those who are guilty, if they are guilty of those allegations, are brought to trial and we're going to cooperate very closely with the Kenyan authorities to make sure that um, that is resolved as quickly as it possibly can be. There is a sense that the behaviour of some of our service pe people, particularly men, uh, is, is, is such that they seem to think that actually because they play this incredibly important role, they're allowed to do all sorts of other things. And that has both 
that brings the army and the other services into disrepute. It also, by the way, I imagine, discourages women from joining and wanting to stay in the armed forces. This, this, this is all bad. The bottom line is that you cannot have um, the sort of culture that leads to this sort of behaviour and these sort of allegations. No, it's, it's fundamentally disgraceful. Um, and in no way uh, can the armed forces um, be happy if that occurs. Um, it will be a deterrent to all sorts of things that we espouse, uh, and we must get to the bottom of it. General Sir Nick Carter there. COP26 finished late last night, and we're still ploughing through the wealth of detail, but the immediate reactions were mixed, to say the least. I'm joined now by Labour's Shadow Business and Ener Energy Secretary, Ed Miliband. Good morning, Mr Miliband. Good morning, Trevor. Two weeks of talking, and um, some say that yesterday was a substantial breakthrough. Others say COP was a flop. Where are you on this? Well, I would say that after Glasgow, Trevor, 1.5 degrees, keeping 1.5 degrees alive is, uh, frankly, in intensive care. And it's our job uh, in the next 12 months to show that we can save it. The reason I say that is because the task of Glasgow and the task of the world is to halve global emissions over the coming decade. That's by 2030. That's what the scientists tell us is necessary to keep 1.5 degrees alive. And, and the truth about Glasgow, despite some progress, is that the world is only probably about 20% or 25% of the way to that goal. So there is a chasm now between where we need to be in halving global emissions uh, and all major countries have to step up uh, and play their part in that uh, and where we are. Uh, you've uh, actually said that the developed countries have a particular responsibility to those countries which are still developing. Uh, essentially, that countries like Britain, uh, European countries and so on, uh, have the bigger burden uh, to play here. Uh, did yesterday's result tell you that we, that we, in the developed world, have uh, failed in that, uh, in that responsibility, or have we succeeded? I think we are dragging our feet, really, in a, in a very problematic way. You know, you know, I was part, Trevor, of the 2009 Copenhagen uh, summit, the, the equivalent of, of Glasgow's summit yesterday. And at that summit, a promise was made to developing countries, which is to developing and vulnerable countries, that, that $100 billion of finance, public and private finance, will be provided to them by the richer world. And, and this is about an existential crisis that so many of these um, countries are facing. And so many of them so, talked so movingly at these talks about the fact that their, you know, their countries will literally disappear if action is not taken. Well, the problem is that more than a decade on, this finance has not been delivered. And the key thing, Trevor, is that there isn't just a moral reason to do that. There is also, frankly, a self-interest reason, because the reason that the Paris summit of 2015 succeeded, in a way perhaps that Glasgow didn't, is that an alliance was built of vulnerable countries on the one hand and developed countries like ours on the other to, to drive forward ambition and also put pressure on big countries like China to act. Now, now, because in the final hours of this summit, developing countries were still arguing about whether this 100 billion would be provided, I'm afraid that coalition wasn't properly formed. And I just have to sort of, sort of say, because I have nothing but praise for Alok Sharma, uh, who you're, you're having on later on, and the job he did as COP president. But I'm afraid the rest of the government didn't help him and undermined him with decisions like cutting overseas aid, because we were then saying to other countries, please step up on climate finance when we were stepping back on aid to poorer countries. Well, whether the rest of government helped or not, let's just deal with what happened yesterday. Had you been sitting in Alok Sharma's seat and the Indians and the Chinese and nobody seems to be mentioning the Australians had turned up and said, look, this phasing out coal's got to go. Let's have a phrase like phasing down. What would you have done? Would you have accepted that or would you have said I'd rather have no agreement than this agreement? Well look I'm very hesitant to second guess Alok because I think he's done an amazing job to be honest and I think he's impressed people around the world 
with his diligence uh, and his commitment and his integrity. I, I wish that the um, change, last minute change hadn't been made, but I wasn't privy to those discussions. I think there is a wider lesson here though, which is we need to do more to put pressure on all of the big emitters, uh, frankly. Um, that includes India, that includes China, it includes countries like Australia, Trevor. You know, we're, we're doing a trade deal with Australia and we've agreed to drop the Paris temperature commitments from the, the trade deal. Now, Australia is a real laggard on climate. They've got a net zero target to get to zero emissions in 2050, but it's not really a proper plan. And they've got 2030 targets that if every country was doing what they're doing, would take us to four degrees of warming. Now, that would be catastrophic for the world if we ended up in that position. So I think part of the lesson of the, what, you know, what's going to be different in the next 12 months compared to the last 12 months is that for, for all countries, the climate policy can't sit on the side of their other approaches, of their other policy. It's got to be, it's got to be at the heart of what we do. We should be rewriting that Australian trade deal. We should be saying to Australia, look, I'm afraid if you want to be part of the Club of Nations, if you want a trade deal with us, then you've got to step up. And, and, you know, I think it's really important, this, that we can't leave Glasgow. You know, Glasgow was modest progress. It wasn't the transformation we needed. But we can't leave Glasgow and, and if you like, step back. The fight to really keep 1.5 alive starts here in the run-up to COP27. Well, this, this comes right to the point, doesn't it? What are we prepared to give up to make this kind of thing happen? Because China and India and pretty much everybody else can say always, uh, you know, you can yell at us as much as you like, but until you do your part, uh, why should we make our citizens suffer? Let's just start. The 100 billion that you rightly referred to hasn't yet been delivered. I mean, how, how are the um, small states, island states, uh, 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 supposed to believe anything that we say when we haven't even fulfilled a pledge from 12 years ago? I mean, you are completely right about this, Trevor. Uh, you're completely right. And, you know, <coughs> it's the 100 billion. And as I say, we should restore the overseas aid cut. Look, look, we, we, cutting overseas aid was the single worst decision this government made in the run-up to COP because it undermined our moral authority it meant that when we were going to the French, the Germans, the others, and saying, please step up on climate finance, they were saying, well, how can you tell us to step up? You're the only G7 country uh, to cut aid. But, you know, it's not just about the issue of the 100 billion, because the 100 billion, you know, it, it might surprise your viewers to know this, the 100 billion is, in a sense, the starting point for the cost these countries are going to face. But it's also about things like vaccination. You know, it is a scandal that when you look across the developing world, we've got one or two percent of populations in some parts of the developing world that have been vaccinated. And I'm afraid we haven't, the, the, Boris Johnson said at the G7 summit in Cornwall that we would vaccinate the world by the end of 2022. We are way off that. This is an issue of trust too. And you know, the whole thing here, abroad and at home, is that this is a matter of collective solidarity. This is a matter of whether we are in it together. We're in it together globally and we're in it together in Britain as well, whether we're going to guarantee that we don't just have ambition in tackling the climate crisis, but we also have justice. And, and those two things are absolutely intimately linked. All right. Well, look, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying and, you know, I feel your indignation. But let's get to the raw politics of this. Um, the truth is, it's a hard sell. Uh, for us to do our part uh, on this, we have to be talking to our population about um, new boilers, 18 grand a shot, electric cars, way more expensive than anything that anybody gets in behind the wheel on today, uh, more insulation. Now, is Labour going to be saying to the population, look, everybody, we know this is going to cause, cause us pain, but realistically, we're going to have to bear that pain if we're going to meet these objectives. Are you ready for that? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to be saying and what we have said, which is we have set out a pledge to invest £28 billion extra each and every year between now and 2030 in tackling the climate crisis. And the reason this matters to your question, Trevor, is we have to, we have to make this fair 
for the population. We have to make this fair for citizens. So, you know, the truth is that the cost of electric cars are coming down, but we should be giving zero interest loans to people so that lower and middle income families can afford electric cars. We should be doing more to help subsidize people in the transition to new boil to, 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 to zero carbon heating so that it doesn't cost people more than a new boiler. And, and I'll be absolutely explicit with you, Trevor. I think it is right to make this investment now. It's right to borrow to make that investment. And, and here's the thing. This is the prudent and responsible choice because the normal argument people make against government borrowing to invest is that it will store up debts for future generations. The biggest debt we can store up for future generations is not tackling this crisis. And there is a fascinating report from the Office of Budget Responsibility published in July, which says the costs of climate action, delaying by a decade the costs of climate action, action doubles the overall cost. So acting now is the right thing to do morally, it's the right thing to do economically, and it's the right thing to do to create jobs in our country, to tackle fuel poverty. And, and I'll give you one very concrete example, literally, a national program of home insulation and retrofit around this country, street by street, house by house, could cut bills, cut carbon emissions, create jobs, and make us less dependent on the on international gas. This makes economic sense. All right. Well, uh, let let's see if there's a, a pledge that can be made here. Um, cut emissions by half by 2030, net zero by 2050, and Labour will do whatever it is, ne whatever is necessary, uh, to coin a phrase used by the current Chancellor, whatever it takes to meet the initial outlay for the consumer and the citizen to meet those pledges. Labour will do whatever it takes. Well, we absolutely have to do whatever it takes. You know, you know and, and actually we need to go further and faster than the numbers that you just said. And look, the, the reason this, this matters is because if we end up, look, after Glasgow, the scientists tell us that on the basis of the pledges made by countries, we're heading for 2.4 degrees of warming. Now, that might, not, that might sound to some people quite harmless, but you know what it means? It means billions more people facing extreme heat waves. Uh, we had terrible floods in Doncaster in my constituency in 2019 and in 2007. It means more extreme weather events like that. And the other thing is that... You know, yep. it's, this is not. I'm not just in the let's avoid disaster business because actually, but, by creating, by by investing, we can create good jobs. We can tackle fuel poverty. We can create cleaner air. See, I think part of the argument uh, that people like me need to make this stronger, Trevor. Just okay. to make the point is is that this is about creating okay. a better world and a better life for people. All right. Well, let's bring the people of Doncaster into this conversation. Um, Everybody can say, we must do this. Everybody can be on the side of virtue. But when you say to them on the doorstep, by the way, this is going to cost you thousands of pounds because, because we have to do it. Otherwise, you know, other people will be underwater. We'll have all sorts of problems. Do they say uh, in Doncaster, yes, we understand, Mr Miliband. Yes, here's, I'm, I'm going to start saving now. Or do they say, oh... Not but sure about I think that. I'm, I think I'm saying something different to you, Trevor. And I think this is a difference between our approach and the government's approach, because we're lucky in this country that both parties want to tackle this problem, but we've got different ways of doing it. I'm saying to you that government needs to make the investment so that it's financially possible for people to make yeah, the change. Yeah, but, but government's and money doesn't on. come out of, out of nowhere. It comes out of that, well, uh, out of well, the, no, the people I, that vote for you. No, but, well, I'm saying something quite explicit to you, though. I'm saying we borrow now to make this investment because it will save money in the long run, and it's the prudent and responsible choice. You see, I think the British people are in a very... We will eventually have to pay it this. back. I, I, I think that, that yeah, well, yes, yes, but we'd have to pay a lot more back if we didn't act. You see, I think the British people are in a very sensible place on this. I think they're saying we want to go green, we want to do the right thing, but don't make this a rich person's luxury make it possible for us to make this change and we will come with you. And also, don't look both ways. Don't cut uh, air passenger duty for domestic flights. Don't do right. things which suggest you're saying one thing and doing another. All right, just very briefly, if I'm, I may, every time I've, I've asked the question I'm about to ask you to your colleagues, they've um, prevaricated. New oil field on uh, uh, stream, possibly in Scotland, Cambo it's called, a new coal uh, production facility in Cumbria. Shortly after yesterday, 
Labour must now say neither of those should go ahead. You're right. Neither of them should go ahead. No prevarication, clarity. We cannot have the Cambo oil field going ahead because it's the equivalent of 18 coal-fired power stations running for a year. We should not be having a, the, a new coal mine in Cumbria. Frankly, it looks like total hypocrisy when we are trying to persuade other countries to act. You're right, Trevor. This does change things. We do need to show we're going to act, and we need to show that we're, that we're not facing both ways as a country. That's been the problem with this government, and we need clarity okay. and strength when it comes to the climate emergency. Ed Miliband, that is appreciated. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's get an independent analysis of just what's been agreed at Glasgow and whether it will be enough to limit the catastrophic effects of climate change. Professor Sadita Helm is a professor of energy policy and economics at Oxford University. Last week, the... Uh, so I beg your pardon. Uh, let me... Let me... Uh, uh, Talk to you, Professor uh, Helm, before I go on to anybody else. Um, COP26, progress or just more, to use the cliche, blah, blah, blah? Well, it's a bit more of the latter than the former. If the objective at COP26 was to keep 1.5 degrees alive, it's dead. Uh, even if for the first time ever, Every country does everything that it promised to do. Uh, we won't uh, be able to achieve 1.5. And I think it's important to recognise that after 30 years of COPs, one after the other, in every single year for the last 30 years, we've nevertheless added two parts per million of carbon to the atmosphere. No breaks, no hesitations every year, including even last year during the lockdowns. So if you ask the question, is COP26, you know, the turning point of all the rhetoric that was trotted out before, um, as before all previous COPs, the answer is no. It tells you this isn't going to happen. And there's a very good reason for that, which is that there is this illusion that, you know, climate change is going to be solved in the UK. If only we do stuff here, it's going to be fine. We're going to be world leaders and we're going to crack it and therefore not avoid, uh, therefore avoid the costs, as Ed Miliband said, of climate change. No, the truth is that the future of, of climate in this world will be largely determined in places like China, India, sub-Saharan Africa, in the rainforests and so on. And if you look at this summit, even in the voluntary pledges, the key players are not at the table. And the 80% fossil fuels, which are the mix of our energy and the globe now, there's no plan to go from 80% fossil fuels to naught globally. Indeed, that's starkly absent from the discussions at Glasgow. So let's not so, be so delivered. What, this solves, solves the problem. It certainly doesn't. So what was the point of the last two weeks? You make it sound like it was just a complete waste of time. No, no. It's very good that people talk. It's very good that people are educated about what's going on, but it's not good to believe that these great summits are the crunch point that's going to turn the globe. That isn't what these things are about. And if we really seriously want to get in the game of no longer causing climate change, we have to get the metrics right. So it's not whether you produce steel in Britain that counts as opposed to import it. It's that there is steel in our mix, territorial carbon emissions. You can get those down by closing down the steel industry if that's what you want to do. What matters is our carbon consumption, our carbon footprint. And that's part of trade. That's about carbon border adjustments. That's about carbon pricing. All the stuff that wasn't discussed at COP is absolutely critical to proper engagement. So you and I can genuinely say we are no longer causing climate change. Let's come back to some of those, uh, if you like, other factors, but just dealing with what COP itself dealt with, afforestation or, or the, I think the slogan now is cash, cars, uh, trees and so on. Um, can you make an estimate, there are various numbers flying around, but can you make an estimate uh, of what uh, temperature rise we're headed for given the promises that were made yesterday? If they were all fulfilled, where would we be? Well, the, the best estimate in the public domain 
is the 1.8 to 2.4. And my guess is it's much closer to 2.4 than it is to 1.8. And um, that is really serious. That's a, a, a dramatic uh, change which is going to happen in this century and affect all of us. Um, and when we look at you know, how we affect that, which is how we persuade the developing world not to go down the route that we've gone down in the developed world, you know, core to this is, well, how are we going to help them do it? After all, we put most of the stuff up in the atmosphere. What's our contribution? Well, let's look at what our contribution is. The amount to be spent, private and public, on dealing with the great disaster of the uh, destruction of the rainforests in places especially like the Amazon is less than we wasted on track and trace in this country. The 100 billion, which we've never lived up to in the past, is a bit more than the annual dividend of Saudi Aramco and uh, quite small compared with what we spent in 18 months in this country on coronavirus. These are the sorts of orders of magnitude which tell you the difference between the brave words and what really needs to be done to help uh, sub-Saharan Africa, India, indeed even China, address what is the major source of future emissions and the major source of the damage to our rainforests and so on. I want to come back to what you think should be done, but just paint a picture for us of, that, of the consequences of that 2.4 degrees that you uh, mentioned a moment ago? Well, there are two answers to that question. There's the obvious one, which is that a hotter world is genuinely going to be bad for most countries around the world and worse for some rather than others. Uh, as to the exact effects, this assumes that we know precisely how to model the world's climate with, say, two, three degrees of warming in it. And that's not true. It's very complicated as to how higher temperatures affect all sorts of things, from weather patterns right through to uh, the tundra and so on, whether it triggers dramatic changes like the release of methane from the Arctic. So I think the honest answer is we don't know precisely, but there are no suggestions that it's going to be a good thing and quite a lot of suggestions it's going to be a bad and perhaps very bad thing. Uh, let, let me put an alternative point of view to the one that you've been putting to me. Um, the Prime Minister says that Britain's well on its way to net zero and we don't need a hair shirt to achieve it. Wouldn't it be lovely if cakeism really was true? That you can have all the smarties and it isn't going to cost you anything at all. Let's be straightforward about this. We're taking a carbon-intensive economy and in... Uh, 14 years, we want to get rid of 75% of emissions. And in 29 years, we want to get rid of virtually all of them. And you tell me, oh, it's going to cost you very much. Now, um, in your previous interview with Ed Miliband, he was careful to say that the costs are less than the costs of no, not acting. That's an admission there are a lot of costs. And we should be honest. You should tell the truth. You know, if you've got to take your boiler out, if you've got to change the way you drive, if you've got to change all that stuff in your carbon diary every day of the stuff you consume, if you've got to do all that lot, the idea that, you know, we're living beyond our carbon means, we're not paying for the pollution we cause, that suddenly we're going to pay for the pollution we cause, and by the way, the price is going to be zero. This is nonsense. And the way to think about it is to think what the carbon price would have to be to hit the target which, by the way, would be one of the most efficient ways of getting there. It's not naught. So there are substantive costs out there. There is going to have to be some change on the demand side and our lifestyles, as well as change on the supply side. But, you know, hoping the technological troops are coming down the hill rapidly to save the day, you know, 29 years away is not really long enough for much technical change. You know, we've got to do okay. it with what we've got. And 235... So what new technology do you think will be on the system in 235 that's not on the system today, which is going to make a substantive difference? Not a lot. OK. Pro Professor, let, let me lastly just put um, this, this to you. Uh, it's all very well, uh, politicians would say, for the professor of this, that and the other at Oxford University to describe the perfect scenario and tell us we've got it all wrong. 
but you don't have to sell this to voters who are going to have to pay. This is unrealistic politically, isn't it? Yeah, I completely agree with you, right? And what that tells you is, it's not that our politicians are come some kind of villain of the police, peace. It's not that our politicians don't understand the nature of this problem. They do. The point is that you and me, the public, don't want to pay the cost. So if you ask the public, would you like to do something about climate change? They get it. That's, uh, and Glasgow has really helped in that process. They really understand this is a really serious problem. Uh, no doubt about it. The opinion polls show that. If you ask them, would you like to pay? Or would you like cheaper regional air flights? Um, or, or, or would you like um, uh, you know, to have airports further subsidised? Would you like not to pay extra fuel duty? That's also yep. one. What it tells you is okay. why climate change is so hard to crack is that actually we, and it's ultimately you and me that consume this stuff, the polluters, don't actually want to pay. And, you know, that's a nasty political reality which has to be confronted. But just simply giving people what they want and telling them that they can have cakeism, that isn't leadership. That doesn't help. This is a really serious problem and we need to get okay. on. Professor Helm, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. OK, last week, the Commonwealth Secretary General warned COP26 in Glasgow that if we lose vulnerable nations who have battled with courage and resilience, we lose the fight against climate change. She warned that if the gaps on emissions were not closed and more money was not made available, then many nations risked being subsumed by rising sea levels. And she urged everyone at COP to dig deeper and come together. Let's find out if she believes everyone has dug deep enough. And I'm now joined by Baroness Patricia Scotland. Um, the Union Secretary General said that the collective political will isn't enough to overcome some deep contradictions and our fra fragile planet is hanging by a thread. We're knocking on the door of climate catastrophe. Was what was agreed yesterday good enough for the Commonwealth and particularly for the small islands within it? I think it uh, wasn't good enough but it was part of the way. I mean, Antonio Guterres was absolutely right. We are at Code Red. And it is deeply worrying that we have to deep, dig even deeper. The truth is that we are now at 1.1. And if you look at the devastation that that is causing to many of us, you've seen the effects here in the United Kingdom, but look at what's happening to the small and the vulnerable member states. In our commonwealths, we have 32 small states. 25 of them are island states, and many of them are facing this existential threat now at 1.1 degrees. If you look at what's happened in sub-Saharan Africa, we have had double the number of um, uh, droughts, floods, what does that mean? That means that there are 45 million more people in Southern Africa who are vulnerable to food insecurity, that we have had 45.6% of those who would have had uh, better food now have substandard food. These are terrible realities. The um, representative from the Maldives, in a sense, reflected some of this and said that Yesterday's uh, decision reflect really was a death sentence for them. I mean, how could it possibly be acceptable in that situation? Well, I think it's it's not acceptable. But let's think about what has happened because you know you know I'm very much a a, a cup half full person. So what happened in Glasgow? Number one, we are all agreed that 1.5 is the aspirational target. No one is saying that the science isn't pointing in that direction. For the first time, we have not only governments and local governments, but we've got business and the scientists and all of us pointing in the right direction. We have an agreement on methane. We have an agreement that we have to do a lot more on deforestation. We have got an agreement in relation to how much money is needed. But what has not happened... Uh, we Secretary, haven't got the mechanisms of how to do it. Secretary Daniel, would you just hold that for a moment? We have some breaking news. Uh, the Queen has decided, it's been announced this morning, that with regret she will not be attending the Remembrance uh, Sunday uh, 
ceremonies this morning. That is breaking news that has just come in. And we're now going to talk to Rhiannon Mills, our royal correspondent, who I think is in Whitehall right now. Rhiannon. That's right, of course, there was a huge amount of anticipation about whether or not Her Majesty would be here for a Remembrance Sunday. On Thursday, we were told that she would be attending. However, in the last few moments, we have had a statement from Buckingham Palace confirming that, unfortunately, Her Majesty will not uh, be attending the Cenotaph today. Now, I can read you the statement that they've sent through, uh, which says, the Queen, having sprained her back, has decided this morning with great regret that she'll not be able to attend today's Remembrance Sunday service at the Cenotaph. Her Majesty is disappointed that she'll miss the service. So I think one thing to point out there is they're saying that she has sprained her back. Uh, also, I understand that the back sprain is unrelated to the recent doctor's advice that we know that she's had over the last couple of weeks um, to rest. It is obviously really unfortunate timing, but this back sprain has happened very recently. And we're also told that nobody regrets the fact that the Queen can't be here uh, more than the Queen herself. She is deeply disappointed, not least because she regards today as one of the most significant engagements of the year. And of course, that is because she is a member of that wartime generation. During the Second World War, she saw her father rallying uh, the nation as king and also of course her husband prince philip who died earlier this year served during the second world war uh, as well um, just to stress though we are hearing that because of a back sprain the queen will not be able to attend uh, the events here today however other members of her family will still be here in force in attendance of course in recent years the queen has handed over that responsibility of placing a wreath at the base of the cenotaph on behalf of the nation. She's handed that responsibility to her son and heir, the Prince of Wales. He will again uh, carry out that duty. But just to stress, we will not see the Queen here at the cenotaph today. Rhiannon, thank you very much indeed for that announcement uh, that the Queen will not be at the Remem Remembrance Day uh, ceremonies this morning. Um, Baron of Scotland, the Commonwealth plays uh, a major role in today's event. You yourself, I think, lay a wreath. It will be um, disappointing, I think, for many of the veterans. Absolutely. The Queen is adored rightly. She has shown total commitment uh, to the Commonwealth and they, she is much loved. So an opportunity like this to see her and to pay homage for what she herself also did, because people do forget that she was an engineer. She was she was making her contribution as well. So I think there'll be a lot of sadness, but everyone will be wishing her well. Everyone will want to see her again. And she is the beating heart of most of the love that is in the Commonwealth. So we do wish her well. Well, I hope that uh, this is just a, this is just something temporary. It sounds as though it is precautionary, but we will no doubt be hearing more. Now, um, let us return, if we may, to the issues uh, that arose out of yesterday. Part of your role uh, as the uh, head of the Commonwealth uh, Secretariat is to essentially bring all the members of the Secretariat together. Um, is part of your job of the next year going to be, frankly, to stop some of your members, India, Australia, for example, drowning others, for example, Caribbean islands? Well, the most important thing to remember and the great thing about our Commonwealth is we all sit around the same table. And I know that both um, all of our members care desperately about the small states. We're going to have the next Commonwealth um, heads of government meeting in Kigali next year. Climate change is bound to be at the top of the agenda. And it's really important for us to remember, Trevor, that it was the Commonwealth back in 19. 89, way before COP was ever invented, that said that if we did not address this matter, it would be an existential threat. And the Commonwealth is so tired of being right. We want no longer to be right. We want to be able to deliver that 1.5. And I do know that both with India and Australia, there is a love and affection and an appreciation. 
of the small states. And when you sit around that table, eyeball to eyeball, it's a very different uh, occasion. And I think the only place where that actually happens is round the Commonwealth table. And we will be urging, encouraging, and depending on our member states to do what they've always done, and that's to stand in solidarity. It's important to remember that in Malta, when our leaders came together, just days before the Paris agenda, we came up, the Commonwealth came up with two degrees, implementation, and a 1.5 aspirational target. We will be pushing and pushing hard, and I know that our small states, who are literally seeing this as a death sentence, will not go give up because if they do, they'll no longer be here, and we're not willing for that to happen. We will fight. Secretary General, thank you very much for your time this morning. I hope we'll return to this uh, in months to come. Thank you. Last night, after a gruelling two weeks, Alok Sharma, president of COP26, appeared close to tears as he apologised to delegates that the final text of the agreement was imperfect, his word. But he later insisted that there was consensus and support for the Glasgow deal. For his overall take on this historic summit, I'm now joined live from Glasgow by Mr Sharma. Good morning, Good President. Morning, uh, can we just first start with that breaking news from uh, Whitehall that the Queen uh, will not be joining the ceremonies this morning. Uh, I imagine that that will be uh, a matter of some disappointment to you and other members of government. Well, look, uh, obviously I'm very sorry to hear that, but uh, I've just got the news at the same time as you. As I understand, this is precautionary, uh, and of course we wish Her Majesty all the very best. We, um, of course, uh, witnessed... Uh, the emotional ending of uh, COP26 uh, yesterday evening, and um, much of that was focused on you. Was the uh, your reaction exhaustion uh, after two weeks, or just or disappointment at the last minute change from phasing out coal to phasing down coal? Well, Trevor, you know, when we started this whole process two years ago, we said that what we wanted to achieve at Glasgow was to keep within reach uh, the temperature goal of limiting temperature rises to 1.5 degrees. We delivered on that. Uh, there were very many people who doubted it. We delivered on it, and actually that was acknowledged by some of the most climate-vulnerable countries, by some of the climate NGOs as well, and I'm very pleased about that. Not only that... But we also closed off all the outstanding elements of the Paris rule book, the Paris Agreement. After six years, it had not been completed. We did that here. That is historic. And we also ensured that there was more money coming to support uh, developing nations. Uh, and therefore, I think what we've achieved here is something really quite remarkable. Now, on the issue of, of coal, uh, I should point out, Trevor, that for the very first time in any of these conferences, the word coal is actually reflected in the text. That, again, is a first. Uh, yes, of course, I would have liked to ensure that we maintained the phase-out rather than uh, changing the wording to phase-down. But, you know, on the way to phasing out, you've got to phase-down. But ultimately, of course, what we need to ensure is that uh, uh, we continue to work on this, uh, on this deal, on the commitments. And on the, on the issue of coal, China and India, of course, are going to have to justify to some of the most climate-vulnerable countries what happened. You heard that disappointment on the floor. So what I would say to you that, you know, overall, this is a historic agreement. We can be really, really proud of it. But, of course, this is just the start. We now need to deliver on the commitments. I, I fully understand uh, your feelings about the achievements. But um, let me just ask you personally, what, what are your feelings this morning towards the countries who insisted on that last-minute change from phasing out to phasing down. We're talking India, China. I imagine Australia was somewhere in the mix. Well, look, I mean, I think uh, on the floor that uh, you heard interventions from China and, and India. Uh, at the end of the day, my job was to build consensus. That's what I did. I ensured that uh, before we actually went back to the podium, I had checked uh, with uh, the negotiating groups with some of the most climate vulnerable countries that they could accept the language. Uh, and of course, they reluctantly did so because overall, this is really a very good and historic deal. But as I said, at the end of the day, China and India are going to have to justify themselves to these climate vulnerable nations. But you know what uh, some of those developing countries are feeling this morning? Uh, bitterness, 
and the sense that the big polluters, the USA, China, India, Australia, got what they wanted and that they are going home empty-handed and some of them to tell their people that they better prepare themselves to evacuate or have their countries extinct. Well, Trevor, what you heard from the floor yesterday was first appreciation of what the UK has done, but also acknowledgement that this deal does indeed keep 1.5 within reach. Uh, and I can tell you I've had lots of messages uh, since last night uh, from ministers in many of those countries uh, thanking us for what the UK has done, uh, for the fact that we have managed to close off the Paris rule book, for the fact that there is more money on the table to support them. As I said, this is a start. We've got one year of our presidency. We need to make it count. Uh, and that means that we need to hold countries to account for the commitments that they've made, and those commitments have to be translated into action. And for the very first time, Trevor, in this deal, what we have got is an agreement that next year countries are going to have to come back and look at their 2030 commitments. Uh, we've got for the very first time an agreement that every year ministers at a high level are going to meet to discuss this issue. And not only that, but there is going to be a report every year on how we are doing the tracking of these commitments uh, on, on uh, reducing emissions. Those are all you, historic first. But as I said, we need to now ensure that those commitments are delivered upon. You, you know as well as I do, though, that there is deep scepticism. The big countries promised 100 billion for adaptation 12 years ago. It still hasn't been delivered. How will those countries, how are those countries expected to believe these commitments if that commitment from way back then hasn't even been fulfilled now? Well, look, Trevor, uh, you know, I I've been to uh, many of the climate vulnerable countries over the last year and I completely understand uh, their, their sense of frustration. Uh, you know, if you're living on the front line of climate change and literally on a day-to-day -day basis you're being faced with that, of course you're frustrated. But as part of this process, one of the things that we did do, uh, I asked uh, other ministerial colleagues and other governments to pull together a delivery plan. We know with confidence that that uh, 100 billion will come in 2023, uh, it may come earlier, uh, and that over that five-year period from 2021 to 2025, uh, we will have uh, 500 billion plus to support developing countries. That is appreciated. You talked about adaptation. Uh, well, I can tell you that in this text, it makes it very clear that uh, uh, there's going to be a doubling of adaptation finance to support countries by 2025. So we have made progress and countries do acknowledge that. But of course, there is always more to do. This is a 26th COP. There will be another COP. This is a process. But in this case, I think we can say with some justification what we've achieved here is absolutely historic. You said that um, the pulse of 1.5 is alive, but the pulse is pretty weak. What is going to convince you between now and next year in Egypt that those who are responsible for uh, most emissions and most pollution are really taking this seriously and they haven't just kicked the can down the road? Well, I think we will have to track the commitments that each of these countries have made. Uh, and we've had some historic commitments. You know, we've got uh, 130 countries coming together to ensure that by 2030 we're reversing uh, deforestation. I mean, that's covering 90% of the forests in the world. Uh, we've got uh, historic agreements on, on coal as well. Uh, no more international coal financing from any of the G20 nations. There is a lot that has been agreed, but you're absolutely right. We need to make sure those commitments are being delivered upon. As I said, in this text, we have also agreed that next year countries will come back and we will have a look at how they're doing on their 2030 emission reduction targets. That's a historic first. Mr. Sharma, I'd love to carry on talking to you about There's so much to discuss, but as you know, there is breaking news which we have to address. So uh, for this morning, thank you very much indeed for your time.